Hello, I'm William Repay, and I'd like to tell you a story of drama, passion, and commitment about a mysterious and endangered bird, the Kirtland's warbler. The story begins in June 1903 when Norman Wood, an ornithologist and taxidermist at the University of Michigan Museum, receives a tip that Kirtland's warblers could be nesting along the Osabo River near Mayo, Michigan. Although the warbler had been discovered and described in scientific literature some 50 years earlier, very little was known about it, and after a century of amazing scientific discoveries about the wildlife of North America, the fact that so little was known about the Kirtland's warbler had ornithologists frustrated. So when Wood boarded a northbound train, he knew he could be on the cusp of a major discovery. After a two-day journey by train, boat, carriage, and foot, Wood arrives at a desolate spot on the Osabo River where he hears something he has never heard before, the crisp, clear, sweet song of the Kirtland's warbler. After searching the area, Wood finds a female Kirtland's warbler and her nest under a jumble of blueberry and sweet fern plants. In his journal, Wood describes this discovery with joy. Quote, Just south of the tree, I flushed the female from the ground, and after a close look, I saw the nest. It may be imagined with what delight I beheld the first nest of this rare bird ever seen, and with what eagerness I dropped to my knees beside it to make a closer examination of its contents. There were two young birds, perhaps ten days old, and a perfect egg. End quote. Not knowing just how rare the birds were, Wood shot several specimens and dug up the nest for shipment back to Ann Arbor. Wood's discovery ended the mystery of the Kirtland's warbler, but it set the stage for nearly 100 years of drama as the bird teetered on the brink of extinction and obsessed biologists went to extremes to save it. Along the way, there are attempts to hand-raise young birds, crackpot schemes to follow their migrations, life-threatening injuries, encounters with tarantulas, standoffs with army tanks, and futile quests in exotic locations. Even a notorious murderer played an important part in Kirtland's warbler conservation. Following in the footsteps of Wood was one of his students, a brilliant young man from Chicago named Nathan Leopold. In his study of the Kirtland's warbler, Leopold became the first person to warn of the possible extinction because of the threat posed by the brown-headed cowbird, a parasitic bird that was newly introduced to the northern Michigan forest. Later that year, Leopold would be hailed as the world's foremost expert on the Kirtland's warbler, and a few months later, Leopold's life would take a dramatic turn when he and a friend, Richard Loeb, would commit one of the most notorious and famous murders of the 20th century. With few protections in place, the Kirtland's warbler population slid closer and closer to extinction through the middle of the century as the combination of the impact of the brown-headed cowbird and the lack of nesting habitat put pressure on the bird's population. The population decline was documented in the 1971 census, which found only about 400 total birds. Based on the decline, the state of Michigan and the U.S. Forest Service committed themselves to manage more land on behalf of the warbler and control the cowbird. And just when it seemed that the Kirtland's warbler would be saved by this new level of commitment, a fire, set on behalf of the bird, would burn out of control, killing one Forest Service employee and nearly wiping out the small town of Mack Lake, Michigan. The fire was a major setback in the effort to protect the bird, and local residents were outraged that they could be burned out of their homes by a government that seemed to value a bird more than their property. In 30 years since the Mack Lake fire, relations with the community have been largely repaired and the Kirtland's warbler population has grown to more than 3,500 birds. Nevertheless, the Kirtland's warbler is still the rarest warbler species in North America. And because it's still so rare, people from all over the world are drawn to Michigan just to see it. Those who come expect to see it and check it off a list, but they leave charmed. That's because on a sunny day in May or June, a handsome male Kirtland's warbler will sit in the open on a tree branch not far away and sing for hours at a time. Visiting bird watchers are not the only people who have been seduced by the Kirtland's warbler's charm. The very researchers and biologists who spend time studying the warbler in its jack pine forest talk openly about how it seems the bird welcomes them to their world. 
They tell stories about how tame the bird is and about how it will land on a branch a few feet away or land on a hat, a shoulder, or a shoe to inspect the researchers as they do their work. That ability to have such a close interaction with the Kirtland's warbler has tightened the bond the researchers have with the birds and has increased their sense of commitment to it. One of the earliest researchers was Lawrence Walkinshaw, a dentist from Battle Creek, Michigan. Walkinshaw was the first person to band Kirtland's warblers. Remarkably, the only thing Walkinshaw often had to do to catch a Kirtland's warbler was to reach down and lift a female off a branch or out of a nest. Before long, Walkinshaw would step aside for Jocelyn Van Tyne, an ornithologist and curator of birds at the University of Michigan Museum. Van Tyne was a giant in the field, and his research habits were so precise that his name would become synonymous with excellence in ornithology. Unfortunately, Van Tyne would die before he would be able to put his observations on the Kirtland's warbler into book form. Fortunately, Harold Mayfield, a business executive from Ohio who was Van Tyne's closest research assistant, would step in. Mayfield would write the book that Van Tyne never did and go on to establish a simple but incredibly important tool for managing the species, the Kirtland's Warbler Census. Their efforts, along with the work of others, have boosted the Kirtland's Warbler population over the past 40 years to a point where the federal government is now considering taking the Kirtland's Warbler off the endangered species list. But what happens if those endangered species protections are removed? Could the Kirtland's Warbler go into another population tailspin? The answers to those questions are in The Kirtland's Warbler, the story of a bird's fight against extinction and the people who saved it. I hope you enjoy my book.